Well, good morning, church. Good morning, good morning, Grace. Okay, I know we're all excited. We're chatting with our friends. But good morning and welcome to worship. I'm Pastor Katie. With me this morning, of course, Pastor Perrin as well. Delighted to have everybody home for Advent number two this morning. Our Advent series is this theme from generation to generation, and I think today we're going to just see that throughout the worship service. But I also wanted to point out that we've added a few photos to our Advent decorations this year, just representing the different generations that come and celebrate here at Grace. I wanted to make sure that you know as well after church, who's hungry? <laughs> because we have a wonderful dinner waiting for us downstairs prepared by generations of families who've been doing it for years and years. Also, when you came in, you might have seen if you wanted a printed copy of the end of year report and all that we have done together by the grace of God, I'd encourage you to pick it up. There are just wonderful pictures and a celebration of all that God has done in this place this year. I'm going to welcome everyone who's joining us online this morning from Facebook. Feel free to comment, let us know you're here, and share any prayer requests you may have. Now, I will let you know, church, our prelude this morning, if it just doesn't fill your soul with the joy of Jesus, uh, you may need to see me afterwards for some pastoral counseling. So with that, I invite you, let's prepare our hearts and minds as we go to God in worship.
All right, stand back up. <laughs> Please rise, embody your spirit as we call one another to worship. Prepare the way the prophets call. Make ready the highways for God. How we long to walk down the sidewalks in God's kingdom of peace. Prepare your hearts, for God's realm opens up a new day. We yearn for the time when the wolf and lamb will live together in harmony. Prepare the way. God promises a new day when adversaries will lay down their arms. We dream of a world transformed by God's love. May the God of hope fill your hearts with all joy and peace. We rejoice, for God's Spirit is in our midst. Our opening hymn is Come Thou Long Expected Jesus, number 196 in the Red Hymnal. As we celebrate this Advent season, the generations who have come before us and the generations to come and all that God has given us, I'm going to invite forward a very special group in our church that I have nicknamed, whether they like it or not, the over 90 queens and kings this year to light our Advent candle. So I gave you as long an intro as possible for you to come on up and Oh, no, Margaret, you stood up. You got to come up. I see you. I thought we'd have more company. <laughs> Look for the Messiah where you will, but you will find him where you live. This is, he will not be separated and kept apart from those who cry to him. He will be found right in the midst of daily, routine, ordinary stuff of life. So where you're living, look for him. 
in the ordinary niches of living. Look for the holy, that the holy might be found in you. Today we search for holiness of God among those who are crying out, those who cry out for a united church, those who cry out for reconciliation, those who cry out for a church to be a safe place of shelter from the conflicts of our time. We seek the coming Messiah by making this a place where his peace rules in our hearts and our pews as we are called to be one body. On this second Sunday of Advent, we light these candles to remind us that the light of Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace, is most brilliant when his church is united in mission, purpose, and love. Join with me in prayer. In, in the division of your church, in the brokenness of your body, we pray, come Lord Jesus, come reminding us of the covenant with one another. Come and make your church a place, but not by division, by acts of mercy, compassion, and peace. In your name, Amen. can be a good thing. It can help us be attentive while driving down the highway. It can alert us to possible accidents. It can motivate us to do our best. However, fear can also be harmful. For so many of us, fear of the other, fear of failure, or fear of the unknown has led us to make sinful choices in our lives. Choices such as building walls or tearing others down. Today, in confession, we ask for mercy and we pray for guidance. As we confess, we come before an entirely merciful and loving God who says to us, do not be afraid. Let us pray. Patient God, you know just how often we make decisions from a place of fear rather than love. You know just how often we allow fear to take the place of logic, fanning unhealthy fires in our lives. You know just how often we tuck your words, do not be afraid, on dusty shelves and in the back of closets stubbornly holding on to our own point of view. Forgive us for giving fear the microphone. Silence the voices of scarcity, shame, and rejection, which spark and feed so much of our fear to recenter us in love. With hope we pray, amen. Family of faith, even when we forget God's words, God does not forget us. Even when we lose our way, God does not lose us. Even when we fall short or make mistakes, God forgives and holds on to us. We are known, forgiven, and loved. Thanks be to God. Amen. Our response, oh wait, it's a sung response by the choir. <laughs> Oh, 
Shall be exalted, and every mountain and hill made low. The crooked straight and the rough places plain. The crooked straight, the crooked straight, and the rough places plain. And the rough places plain. Every valley, every valley shall be exalted. Every valley. Every valley shall be exalted, and every mountain and hill made low. The crooked straight, the crooked straight, the crooked straight. And the rough places plain, and the rough places plain, and the rough places plain. The crooked straight. Amen. And with that, I'm going to invite you to join with me in your bulletin. Let us affirm our faith together again this Advent season. We believe in a God who knows our fears. We believe in a God who says, be not afraid. We believe in a God who kicks off her shoes and wades into the muck of our lives with us. We believe in a God who stitches herself to our heels and invites us to dance. We believe in a God who hems stars into the night sky so that we can find our way home, and who sends us friends with open doors so we can find our way to love. We believe in a God who finds us in our fear and does not leave us alone. Thanks be to a God for a love like that. Amen. Now I'm going to invite, as you can see, we have a slightly larger group this morning. All right, friends, we're going to try to get here-ish. So everybody, come on over. We'll need to bring chairs or whatever. All my younger friends, come on over. Yeah. 
You got me on? Thank you, Roderick. I have to introduce you to someone who is very special. And Elizabeth, I need you to come on up here too. You gotta help me with this one. You're gonna help me with this one, okay? So you stand right here, and I need this handsome gentleman making his way up here. No, not you, Eric, but my dad. <laughs> have a seat. We, there's too many handsome gentlemen. We got confused. It's okay. Hi, everybody. Look at all this. We can sit along here. We'll make this work, right? We can make this work. I want to introduce someone to you. This is, his name is Phil Cooper, and my name is Katie Cooper Nix. Who do you think this is? This is my grandpa. Oh, bad news. Sorry. <laughs> That, the part. What can I say? Uh, you know what? I will introduce you to the over 90 crowd here in just a second. Now, he is wearing a very special shirt that he's going to show you here in a second. This is planned. Nobody get worried. But he's got something that he's going to show you. Can you grab that one? Okay. So, what, is, what does his shirt say? It says thing one. Now, hold this for a second. Thank you. She gave me a microphone. So now I can tell you all about Pastor Katie. <laughs> okay, what, is, what does my shirt say? Uh huh. Well, wait a minute. Who's this? This is my daughter who doesn't know how to get dressed. It's okay. There we go. Okay, what does her shirt say? We are three generations of Coopers. What does generation mean? I keep saying that phrase throughout Advent. What does it mean? It goes on. Okay, what else do you think generation means? First generation. Generation. Elizabeth, right? So it's Very good. So generation means family, family, right? So there's family before and in a long time. There will be family after. Yes, yes. And that's what we've been celebrating at Advent is that all the generations. Now, I hear you guys have something special happening after church today. What are you doing? You're doing the Christmas pageant? <gasps> Guess what? Here is a picture of kids that were your age, and here's the best part, when he was a baby. That's how long ago this picture was. And you know what's really cool? They had cameras back then. You're going to love this, all right? Because, because right here, so do you see this handsome guy back here with the red tie and blue shirt on, Mr. Paul? He's in this picture. I know. And Miss Mary, right over here, she, now we're all looking at this picture, right? So for generations, we've been having kids be part of the church, and then they get a little bit older. <laughs> and then the next generation gets to tell the story, too. So you guys are stepping in and doing something we've done for generation after generation. Yes, Lillian. Why isn't Steven up there? I couldn't trust him. I felt better with Elizabeth up here. <laughs> well, and here he comes. Here he comes. All right. So what we're going to do is we're going to pray, okay? And actually, speaking of generations, if you notice in my picture, my little man, Caden, has a picture with Mr. John, and that has to be, what, four or five generations between them, Julie? I think a lot. <laughs> One of our youngest and one of our oldest, yes. All right, so we're going to pray together, and then I know Miss Ashley has some great things planned for you guys to do during the service. And then, hold on a second, everybody turn around. Ready? Who is excited to see our youngest generation tell the story of Christmas again after church? Are you excited? Are you excited, choir? There we go. Perfect. All right. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is why we have Children's Christmas Program Sunday. <laughs> All right, we're going to pray together. You guys repeat after me? All right. Dear God, thank you for the families before and the families to come and the family here 
that makes up the church and surrounds us with love. All right, you ready? Count of three. We do our nice big amen. You ready? One, two, three. Amen. All right. You guys may head out with all of our friends, and we'll be back in time for communion. All right? Let's bless our kids with a sung blessing as they head on out. God, whether it's through angels or music, friendships or sermons, study or nature, when you speak, we long to hear it. In a world as chaotic and broken as ours, we could use your words of hope and healing. With gratitude, we pray. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning is, comes from Luke chapter 1. One month later, God sent the angel Gabriel to the town of Nazareth in Galilee with a message for a virgin named Mary. She was engaged to Joseph from the family of King David. The angel greeted Mary and said, You are truly blessed, and the Lord is with you. Mary was confused by the angel's words and wondered what they meant. Then the angel told Mary, Do not be afraid. God is pleased with you and you will have a son. His name will be Jesus. He will be great, and, you, and he will be called the Son of God Most High. The Lord God will make him king as his ancestor David was. He will rule the people of Israel forever, and his kingdom will never end. Mary asked the angel, How can this happen? I am not even married. The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come down to you, and God's power will come over you, so your child will be called the Holy Son of God. Your relative, Elizabeth, is also going to have a son, even though she is old. No one thought she could ever have a baby, but in three months, she will have a son. Nothing is impossible for God. And Mary said, I am the Lord's servant. Let it happen just as you have said. And the angel left. For the word of God of scripture, for the word of God among us, and for the word of God within us, thanks be to God. And in this season of generosity and giving, I just want to say on behalf of the pastors of the church, thank you. Thank you, church, for all the ways that you have lived into this year, not with a spirit of fear or scarcity, but with a spirit of love and abundance. Because of you, our church has been able to reach out in so many ways right here in our community, in our schools, in our neighborhoods. Thank you for being the hands and feet of Christ in this time. And with that, I invite the ushers to come forward to receive our offering.
Holy God, we join the unending hymn and give all glory and honor to you. Use these gifts so that your kingdom may come and your will may be done. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. And the angel said to Mary, do not be afraid. They've just released the list of the greatest fears for 2022. Pretty bold of them, thinking we still have three weeks left, but they, they're going to call it for this year. Number one fear, 2022. Corrupt government officials, followed by people I love becoming ill, Russia using nuclear weapons, polluted drinking water, not having enough money for the future, and so on. What I found a little surprising are the things that didn't make the top 10 list for this year. They're fears that are a little easier to hide. Fears like failure, abandonment, and death. And the angel said to Mary, do not be afraid. Even here? Even now? Then again, after a pandemic where the effects of COVID-19 are still lingering among us and now add on the flu and RSV, perhaps we've all just learned to master our fears a lot better. Or maybe we've just learned to hide them a lot better. There are countless articles being written about all that's happened in the past few years when the whole world shut down. Should have been a time of slowing down, a time of, of rest and renewal. But most of us, turns out, in our attempt to create this illusion of control, actually put in longer hours and worked even harder. Our fear sent us into overdrive. Psalm 23, which I bet many of us even have memorized here in this church this morning. It's a text that has meant so much to our faith journey. It says, even when I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will not be afraid. You lead me beside still waters. You make me lie down in green pastures. Kind of chuckle when I read that line because it's such a great image, right? In the face of danger, God doesn't give out a dose of courage. God has to make me lie down to rest, to let go of that control, to find that my restoration is in God, my grounding is in God, that my holy wonder rests in God. I've shared with you before about my diagnosis of anxiety. And I found support through medication and through therapy, but in essence, I live with fear in my body. It causes me to plan for all these possible unknown outcomes, and it will make my neck start to hurt, my heartbeat will race, and heaven forbid, my stomach is unpredictable when you put me in a new situation. Now, the fear is not in my head. I can function fine, but inside my very muscles and bones, I'm on edge because I know something's going to go wrong. And I got to be ready. And the angel said to Mary, do not be afraid. But think about the task that God was asking of Mary. It was full of fear. The fear of all of her neighbors and friends who are now going to shame her and make her the outcast in this society. The fear that she has to go on this journey to Bethlehem on a donkey with this guy who has no legal obligation to stick around and keep her safe. The very fear of labor and birth where most women didn't make it. Mary's courage to say yes 
is in spite of the fear. Because all around her, the community would be speaking this fear into her life. They'd be whispering. They're pointing fingers. There's no room for you here. Perhaps the promise that the angels give, this promise that with God, all things are possible, was really this assurance that no matter what society throws at you, no matter how fearful all the conversations may be around you, when you say yes to God, you have that grounding. You have that firm footing to walk the path before you. I've seen so many communities that become crippled by fear. And I bet you've seen their effects too, right? People start to break into factions. All these secret conversations are happening. There are threats made if you don't fall in line. The fear of rejection is rampant. But that's not the image of God that we see in our story today. God is not a tyrant. God is not demanding or manipulating Mary to get what God wants. No, God invites, and then God walks with Mary every step of this journey. The angel says, do not be afraid, for God is pleased with you. God loves you, Mary. God is with you. And this Advent season, if there's one thing I am praising God for in my long list, it's here at Grace that we are a place not of fear, but of love. That I know, church, we'll have high and low seasons. We will still have difficult conversations and hard moments, but our foundation has been and will continue to be a place of grace that our conversations about where God is leading us next are never spoken from this place of scarcity, but with the assurance that with God all things are possible. And woven into our vision statements is even this promise that we as a church make, that we will embrace inclusiveness by inviting and accepting all people so they can find Grace Church a place of hope, faith, and safety. That's the very antithesis of fear. That's the foundation of a community of love. That is the same promise that grounded Mary for the journey ahead, hope, faith, and safety. Do not be afraid, beloved of God, for God is pleased with you. Do not be afraid, family of Grace United Methodist Church, for God is with us. And all of God's people said, Amen. And so church as a family, like we have done generations before and generations to come, we're going to come to this table of communion, and I'm going to ask maybe one of the moms or dads over there if you can go grab all of the youngest among us, in just a moment, so they can have their communion as well. Thank you, Eric. I invite you now, let us turn to our liturgy in your bulletin and prepare for the feast. For every Advent, we gather together in the same room to tell the same story of a baby born in a manger. The plot never changes. There are never any surprise or twists. So why do we do it? Why do we keep telling the same story? We tell this story because our spirits need to hear it over and over and over again. Like water in the desert, we need to be reminded that God has drawn close to this hurting world. We need to be reminded that God just couldn't stay away. Every time we gather at this table, we tell the same story. The story of a Messiah who gathered his friends together for one last supper. The story of a Messiah who loved us so much, 
he just couldn't stay away. So, so friends, friends, bring the parts of you that feel like the desert. Bring the parts of you that are aching to hear this story again, because this is good news for, for you. Author of our lives, we admit that there is something so marvelous and wonderful about this season. The glow of the candlelight and the familiar hymns, the kids that are wound tight with contagious, joyful energy, the feeling that something we've been waiting for just might be within reach. Joy and hope are in the air, so thick we could almost bottle it up. But we don't want to just bottle up this feeling, we want to share it. We want to share the joy of this day with the children of this city, with single parents, with lonely young adults, with our unhoused neighbors, and especially with those who are grieving. We want to pour out your good news all over this community. We want to sing like Mary sang until all who are looking for you have found their way home. So help us live like the shepherds who weren't afraid to go and tell the good news. Help us take the words of the angels to heart, to not be afraid. Help us to be as trusting as Joseph, who chose to believe the impossible. But more than anything, give us the courage and conviction to tell this story. In a hurting world so desperate for hope, we have something to say. Joy and hope are in the air, so thick we could almost bottle it up. But we don't want to bottle up this feeling. We want to share it. So pour out your spirit on this table. Strengthen us from the inside out. As we tell your story of good news, let us once again speak the prayer your son taught us to pray, saying, Our Creator, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Just a moment, we are going to invite everyone up to the table of communion. We're going to have four stations here, and there will be a fifth station over in this corner where the communion is a prepackaged element, if you would feel better about that. All of our communion is gluten free, and to remember that in this season, Jesus came to us in the spirit of a child, you may notice that our communion looks very similar to a snack you might have had as a child yourself. I'm going to invite those who are assisting with communion to come forward and come to their stations. And in just a moment, we think it's going to be easiest. The ushers are going to release from the back forward. You're welcome to come take a moment here at the altar and spend some time in prayer. And then return to your seats when you are ready. Of God, come, for we are eager to receive the gift. <laughs>
Will you join with me in prayer? Holy God, for this gift and for the family that we get to take it together with, for the generations that have come before and the generations that come after us, and for your grace that surrounds us all, we give you thanks. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. All right, I'm going to invite you to stand for our closing hymn. The tune is going to sound very familiar, we hope. Let us stand and sing together. Beloved, receive this benediction as you leave this place to go right through those doors down the steps to a feast that is waiting for you and a performance that only Broadway itself could imagine. <laughs> May you go knowing that from generation to generation we have been claimed and loved. From generation to generation God has been by our side. From generation to generation, we are not alone. The God of yesterday and the God of tomorrow knows you by name, loves you, and calls you forth, saying, go be the person you are called to be. Love wildly, do justice, and come back soon. May it be so, and all of God's people said, Amen. Amen.
shaking the floors with that. And I apologize.